Tell us what you think, in person, over the phone, online. Watch and hear yourself on TV. You tell us, we air it. This is The Local Live. Good evening and welcome to The Local Live. As always, I'm Mike Witch. And I'm Jackie Grosha. Finally, Mamaronik is seeing the earliest signs of spring. Now that snow is all gone, we can look forward to the first buds of the season. We have an exciting guest here to talk with Mora at the round table, the supervisor of the town of Mamaronik, Nancy Seligson. But before we get to the round table, let's sneak a peek at some of tonight's stories. League of Women Voters questioned the Largemont candidates. Find out what their answers were. Will the next New York governor be Republican or Democrat? We keep following Andrew Cuomo and Rob Astorino's race to get your vote. Homeless with a child, Westchester mothers are facing the lack of affordable housing. The Local Live is airborne. Find out how you can fly too, right here in Westchester. And last but certainly not least, we have our first ever pet of the This week to prepare for the upcoming large amount elections, the League of Women Voters hosted a breakfast at the Nautilus Diner called Question the Candidates. Since Ms. Ann McAndrews is running for the office unopposed, she and two of the Village of Largemont trustees use the time to focus on the concerns of their residents. As for my opinion of the, uh, the governor's budget, to get back to that, um, he's not doing municipalities any, any, any good on, on this. I mean, you can quote me on that. So keeping Largemont, Largemont, we love what we have, but the infrastructure is horrible. As the mayor stated, Pipes are failing, water systems are going down. Uh, there's some, a lot of large issues. We have a lot of parks, we have a lot of green space, and keeping them in the shape that people need for walking, for sports, is a difficult problem, and, and we're working on it. And the idea seems to be out there that if we do away with the villages, uh, we'll save money. We, we would not if we keep the same level of service that we have, consolidating these into one police force or one fire department doesn't necessarily save that much money. You can watch the League of Women Voters on demand at lmctv.org. And for all of our viewers in Largemont, please remember that the village elections are on March 18th. Just four days after announcing his impending gubernatorial campaign, Rob Astorino set the campaign trail on fire when he admitted smoking a couple of joints way back when in college. At a live interview at CBS Radio, Astorino said this. I mean, I smoked a couple of joints way back when, and but haven't since. So it's been a few years. It's been a long time, because the last time I was uh, a college student, so that's going back 25 years ago. In fact, I said a nickel bag and they just all corrected me and laughed. I guess there's no more, no such thing as nickel bags anymore. So that's how out of the loop I am with that. Additionally, the Republican candidate voiced his views on legalizing marijuana. Listen to this. Well, I certainly sympathize with people who have chronic illness or pain or, or are dying. And so I don't like what the governor tried to roll out, and that is basically take marijuana off the street from drug busts and then give it to patients. Uh, the AMA is opposed to medical marijuana, and so are many other organizations. So I think we have to have a real conversation about this, just not jamming it through. On legalization of marijuana statewide for any purpose, no, I am not in favor of that. I think you, you'll see in a short period of time, Colorado is going to go through a big problem. While Astorino makes the news for his pet pot, past pot use, Andrew Cuomo made the headlines, too, after hiring Republican advisor Susan Del Percio for his re-election campaign. This strategy has been praised since Del Percio has worked in the past with consultants for Cuomo's opponent, Rob Astorino. And now for Mike Witch's In the Media segment. It's like reading five newspapers in five minutes.
Check out the last few issues of The Loop for the latest on the Mamaroneck School's busing plan for next school year and the protests for many parents. It looks like the arguments against the plan are getting louder. Parents have organized Fairness for All Kids to challenge the new policy, which will cut busing to private schools for most students who attend them. The latest edition of The Loop tells you where you can get the actual employment contracts of our school systems, both Mamaronex and Rhinex. Seethrough.net allows you to search for the current collective bargaining agreements between teachers union and the school districts throughout New York State, along with contracts spelling out salaries and benefits for school district superintendents. The Larchmont Patch tells the story of the Spoon Man, who performed for 200 kids last month at the Larchmont Village Center. Jim Krasuski, also known as Jim Cruz, also known as the Spoon Man, plays the spoons all over the world, says the Patch, performing for world leaders and celebrities. He entertained the kids, but he also had a serious message about saying no to drugs, getting hooked on reading, which helped him succeed in school. For more Larchmont news, I suggest the Larchmont Ledger. The March edition has stories about innovations in town operations, help with preparing your tax return, and a new group in town called the Mamaronek Cares Coalition, whose purpose is to help low-income residents. For details on these and lots more, get a copy of the newspaper or go to their website, larchmontledger.com. That's one word and no spaces between Larchmont and Ledger. And that's some of the local news this week in the media. I'm your reporter, Mike Witch. Hi, I'm State Senator George Latimer, and I encourage you to watch every week The Local Live. I was going to say something like, I live in Rye, but if I lived in Larch Rod and Mamaroneck, <laughs> I would watch The Local Live every week. And I just remind <laughs> Hello, I'm Maura Carlin, and you're watching the 13th edition of The Local Live. With me is Alina Suriel, who is monitoring the social media for this conversation. Instead of our roundtable discussion, this is a one-on-one -on -one talk with Town of Mamaroneck Supervisor Nancy Selickson. Nancy's here to take questions and comments from you and from The Local Live about issues in the town. Please call tweet or email the num to the numbers and addresses on the screen. We'll get to them as quickly as we can. So whether you're concerned about taxes, garbage, parking, recreation, whatever, this is your chance. Nancy, thank you for joining us. And my first question is, what do you think is the single most important issue facing the town of Mamaroneck in 2014? The single most important issue is a rather general one, and it's something we've been facing for several years, and that is trying to maintain our high level of services while keeping costs down and keeping taxes steady. And it's hard to do because we have increased costs in our, with our employees, with our supplies, and we have state mandates that continually increase, and it's um, really a challenge but I think we have done a good job of it. We have uh, taken several steps to reduce our costs, and I still think our services are at a very high level. Nancy, you told me earlier that the town is looking to find ways to maintain the services in the town without increasing taxes too much. What ideas are under consideration for revenue generation? You are paying for certain services through taxes in the town, and there's a whole lot that go into that, and it is an overall grouping. But if we're able to separate out some that are user fees, so that it's like recreation. People don't pay for the pool unless they join the pool and pay for a membership at the pool. But they have a choice as to whether they want to use a pool. You don't really right. have a choice as to That's whether you're right. going to have sewers. But you. But in a lot of circumstances in the town, we're providing an unlimited service to people regardless of their use. So if, look at garbage pickup, actually. When and that you was have another some, next one I wanted to get yeah. to, actually. Um, if folks are using um, uh, our garbage and sanitation services, which everyone does who lives in the right. community, um, and you are a family of only two people, maybe elderly two people, you have very little waste, probably. But if you're a family of six or seven kids, plus parents, 
plus help or whatever, you probably have a lot of waste. And you are being charged for that waste the same as everyone else. So it's an equal charge according to your taxes um, throughout the community. So it seems to us uh, when we're trying to think of ways to institute user fees to remove them from the tax base that it might make sense and we certainly haven't even come close to making any decision like this it's just certainly in preliminary discussion to have people pay on their actual use of the services. And has there been discussion that that might discourage families from moving to the community? I mean if you know you pay more because you have children as opposed to but it's not if you have children it's de depending on your use of the service and there's plenty of um, municipalities that do charge uh, on use right now so um, I don't think I've never, it would I've never heard of it other yeah. than for certain communities in Connecticut there is no public right uh, system so right. everyone pays for yes. their own right but I've never heard of communities so yeah there are some separately. in New York that are doing it now and so you know we have just started to explore it and see if it could possibly work here are there other revenue generation ideas coming up um, well we're hoping that um, interest rates go up <laughs> <laughs> for investments which is something that we shouldn't count on at all but uh, we have seen a little increase in the sales tax and the mortgage recording tax we have uh, instituted a program to go after people who owe us back taxes. We haven't done that in the past uh, for quite a while. So we have uh, started reaching out to those folks and letting them know that uh, we're going to be very interested in seeing that. So that has uh, helped and increased our revenue a little bit. Has the business environment or the la uh, fewer empty spaces helped? I mean, is the, are there fewer? Uh, in the town of Amerinac, we have such a small commercial area that it really doesn't have that great an impact on the okay. town um, and in fact we haven't had very many empty uh, or, or vacant stores in the town uh, we they've been pretty much uh, occupied which is okay. good before we go to the next question I want to remind viewers to please call tweet email um, she's here to answer your questions take your comments there's discussion of a sustainability plan for yes. the town. Can you tell us what that's sure. about? Sure, I would love to because I'm really interested in helping the town of Maranek reduce more costs and that is by reducing energy use. Energy, uh, paying for fuel, paying for oil, paying for gas, all of those things are large expenses for the town and, and expenses that we can't control. So if we can reduce our use of those, we can save money. And we have the benefit as well of reducing our carbon footprint and reducing greenhouse gases. So uh, a sustainability plan is an effort to plan for the future of the community in a way that we do not use up all our resources or spend all our resources uh, in a way that is unsustainable so that our children and our children's children can still enjoy what we all love about the town of Mamaroneck now and what's here now as well as planning to be smarter about using our resources going forward. So we're looking at um, all different kinds of issues and we held two interactive workshops in the town and we invited residents from two homeowners associations and other members of the community to participate and we asked them about specific issues in the town for resiliency in, in um, bouncing back from uh, storms and, ish and um, different kinds of uh, issues that hit the town. Certainly Storm Sandy was uh, a, a perfect example. Sustainability and quality of life. And we heard from them that flooding is an incredible issue for uh, folks in the town of Maranek as is power interruption, interruption of power and the electric uh, uh, electricity, basically. So there was a lot of interest in talking about burying the lines and whether that would be helpful in protecting our power sources. And is that is that a sustainability issue? I guess I thought sustainability was being able to almost be self-sufficient. And that is part of it as well. It's actually a very broad category. Mm -hmm. So we are currently taking the information and data we got from those interactive workshops and we have a sustainability collaborative which is what we call our environment committee and I've got five people who are professionals in the arena working on it and we are drafting a plan based on some 
community, other communities' plans. We're using those as templates. New Rochelle and Rye City both have great plans. And we're using the data we got from our residents to figure out what topics are most important and how can we address them. So hopefully we'll be setting benchmarks, metrics, and targets for reducing energy use in different arenas in the town and for enhancing life in the town, making safer bicycling and walking opportunities, more information about our um, environmental or conservation areas, um, uh, trying to reduce litter, uh, improve traffic. There were all kinds of things that people brought up as issues they'd like to see us address. Is there a timetable for this? Yes, we plan to have a draft by October and uh, that draft will be um, distributed among uh, a pretty broad group and we'll certainly have public hearings on it. We might even have some more workshops on it, but we're excited about it because many communities have crafted a sustainability plan and it gives you a blueprint of how you'd like to progress going forward. A little bit of a strategic plan in how to run your business and how to run your community. That sounds very promising. Yeah. Now I know another thing you wanted to talk about was an ESCO, which uh, energy service contract. Yes. Uh, and I, I think it applies to renovations at the ice rink, street lamps, town center, and the firehouse? That's correct. Why don't you tell us about that? <laughs> That's um, really another exciting initiative that came out of our sustainability collaborative. And an energy service contract or an energy performance contract is a new way to structure a project or multiple projects with a new way of financing for them, for municipalities. It's a new, relatively new law in the state of New York that allows municipalities to bundle together several projects that accomplish energy savings and use that energy savings to actually pay the debt service on the borrowing to do it. So you get a real bang for your buck, but you also get two incredible benefits rather than a conventional method of just bonding for each different kind of project. And that is, you get guaranteed energy savings. We're working with a contractor. Oh, I should maybe mention the other one first. You only have to work with one contractor. In municipal government, you often have to, not often, you always, always. have to work with multiple contractors and multiple trades for each project, depending on the scale. And you have to bid at each project. Exactly. Out. In this case, with this law, we are allowed to bid with one contractor, and they we work only with them, and they bid everything else out. And this is really a financing method. It is a structural and a financing method, because they also provide the opportunity to um, uh, to lease from them if you if you want to. But in the town, we have a very good bond rating and we're looking at the possibility of bonding it. But the two benefits would be one contractor and guaranteed energy savings. Which means money. Yes. <laughs> we have a tweet. <laughs> Okie doke, so this one is from Asher Collins and he says, why is it so hard to find affordable housing in Mimernik? This is a big issue, we hear yes. it a lot. Um, why? I don't, I don't know if I can go into all the answers of why. I'm just trying to make the opportunity for more fair and affordable housing uh, uh, increase that opportunity. Well, there are actually two. I'm going to butt into Asher's sure. question and break it into two segments. There is the county settlement fair and affordable yes. housing issue. But there's another issue. There was recently a report that uh, the county, and I think this is one of the communities, losing 25 to 34 year olds because they can't afford to live here. I don't know if you saw that. Yes, I did. And, and that may be a different issue. It might not be, yeah. but it... Well, the plain fact is it is very expensive to live here. Our housing stock is very expensive. Our land is very expensive. Our taxes are very high. I want to remind everyone that your taxes that are paid to the town of Mamaroneck are only 20% <laughs> of your tax bill if you live in the unincorporated area. 20%, not more. Um, so... It is very difficult to build housing that is affordable if you have such incredibly high land costs and, and housing costs. That's just the fact of what's happening right now. But we um, took the uh, advice and also the, um, uh, the information from the county housing settlement and very seriously looked at how can we increase the opportunity to build fair and affordable housing in the town. And 
Uh, first of all, we talk to the federal monitor and HUD to explain to them that we do have a lot of opportunities now, and we have uh, throughout time, and the town has always been very interested in that issue and expanding it. But we also decided to amend our zoning and allow for multifamily housing in the business and service business districts in the town of Mamaroneck. So when you think of the areas that have businesses along the Post Road, along Myrtle Boulevard, um, you can now, as of right, build multifamily housing or residential units in those areas. And that is a change in zoning that allows for a lot more opportunity. And has that translated into fair and affordable housing projects? Well, we just did it in <laughs> October. So oh, nothing's gone up no, yet. No, <laughs> and I haven't seen anything new yet. However, I am hopeful. And we didn't expect it to happen instantaneously. It's a, it's a long-term change that we're building for and hoping for. And we do know that over a 10-year period, we could expect to see over 300 units of uh, of housing that could be built. And does the community have the ability, the infrastructure, to absorb 300 extra units? So when you guys get a yes. chance, we have an email. Ah, okay. okay. But the answer to that is yes. Okay. We did an environmental impact study to say yes. Okay. Okay, so this comes <clears throat> from Josh Polisano. I don't know how to read that. Sorry about that. Um, and it says, why was Tom Murphy appointed to town council when he is a village resident? Village of Mamaroneck. Um, I guess that, so. It says it just says village resident. Yeah, uh, because he was and is <laughs> the best available candidate we had and have, and we're very happy to have him on the town board. Well, let me ask you a question related to that, and it's more of a theoretical political discussion. As you, he was alluding to, um, Josh was alluding to. I think there was some banter in published accounts of former supervisors saying it wasn't right that the town, the unincorporated part of the town didn't have a majority on the town board. We, as far as I know, we don't have like districts where each geographical community has, right. okay. Is that something that's being discussed or should be discussed for the town? Because that's sort of where I thought they were going with that. Is that something that comes up? No. Okay. <laughs> it never has. It never has. Um, we all serve at large. Uh, we all take an oath of office to serve to the best of our ability uh, for the unincorporated town of Mamaroneck and for the entire town of Mamaroneck. I happen to live in the village of Larchmont. Um, I feel that I have never even had a moment's thought of not serving the best as I possibly can for the town of Mamaroneck, the entire town of Mamaroneck. And I think people who live in the villages are part of the town of Mamaroneck, I mean, legally right. and uh, philosophically. In fact, I feel like the two villages in the town of Mamaroneck form a sort of Mamaroneck Larchmont region. And I have said that many times publicly. It's almost like a little, little mini region because we're so interrelated and we share so many things and we have such good working relationships among us and the town is uh, the administrator of many tri-municipal, town-wide services. So um, I, I don't think it's necessary, and I think it's great to have someone uh, from the village of Mamaroneck on the town board. And He is the only one from the village yes, of Mamaroneck. Yes, he is. We haven't had a member from the village of Mamaroneck in quite a while. And um, there's 11,000 people in the village of Mamaroneck who vote for the town of Mamaroneck uh, board members. Um, also, Tom had experience on the village board in Mamaroneck, so his experience is so uh, unusual and important, and we're really lucky to have him in that sense. Okay, Josh, we hope that answered your question. We, we were running out of time. I know we started on the ESCO. Is there anything else you needed to add on that, or I have another question for you? Um, well, I just wanted to let folks know that the um, point of the ESCO, I was talking about the structure and the um, financing of it, is we're going to use the funding that we borrow for it to update the ice rink, the town center, the street lights, and the firehouse. And they're really important upgrades for the ice rink and the town center because those are very old 
uh, pieces of property that are falling apart, and the ice rink desperately needs to be renovated. And there's, those are things that are used by the community daily. Oh, yes, Everyone. and loved, yeah. dearly, yes. dearly loved. And the ice rink is the largest energy user in the town. So by upgrading that, we're going to build in some efficiencies there that are going to be very, very uh, productive for the town. But I do have to warn, yeah. we are not doing the cosmetics. We're oh. really <laughs> doing the... Uh, compressors, the dehumidifiers, the lighting. I mean, it's things that, you know, hopefully you will notice in that it's a more robust uh, enterprise, but it's not going to be beautified that much. I wish that we could do that too, but that's a whole lot more money. And one more part of it that's okay. so exciting is that we are replacing or renovating 1,300 streetlights to LED lights. And that will save us so much energy and so much money. It will. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. And unfortunately, we're already out of time. Mm. Uh, big thank you to you, Nancy Seligson, uh, who's the supervisor of the town of Mamaroneck, for joining us at the local You're live welcome. and for graciously responding to our questions and those of our viewers. Thanks to all of you for participating. For Alina Suriel, the staff and volunteers of the local live, I'm Maura Carlin, and we'll see you next week. watching The Local Life on LMC TV. Homeless mothers in search of a permanent home and a better future for their children face a growing obstacle. Cuts in affordable housing programs, including subsidized rents. Brenda Blanco has more on this story. Nadine Bell's shift has just started. She checks who's in. Make sure like they came in with the... Moves on to double check the chore list. Every day someone has to cook. Then walks inside a dining room and gives advice to a group of homeless mothers. And it might seem like it's never going your way. Mrs. Bell works at Providence House, a homeless shelter in New Rochelle. Their job? We house women and children, pregnant women, older women, you know, with kids. With kids and no place to stay. They come to shelters like this one looking for help. I had a baby. He's four months. I use this as like a, uh, something to just help me out until I get on my feet. At the Department of Social Services, Stacy Reynolds works on making sure that Anderson and the others accomplish their goals. From day one, starting an independent living plan and looking for permanent housing. An independent living plan consisting of an educational background, employment skills, help with any substance abuse or mental health issues, and even a medical assessment, all intended to help these women, even when... The reality is affordable housing in Westchester um, is, is very scarce. Budget cuts are also a big part of the problem. The Section 8, which is, which is federally funded uh, subsidies, th there's basically a freeze with that right now. That means more homeless mothers. According to Reynolds, since 2012, the numbers have steadily increased by around 25 percent. There are more than 3,000 homeless in Westchester. More than half are mothers. Mrs. Belt is aware of it, not just because she works with them. I was 16 when I had my first child. I was homeless. Like most homeless women, she was a victim of domestic violence. She needed a place to go. And it was a struggle. And at that time, I was under the impression nobody cared. But this same shelter welcomed her. She lived here, slept in the same room where she works today, and fed her child in the same place she gives advice. Providence House found her a home, a job, and a new purpose in life. I'm full of love, and I just want to give it, you know, excuse me, I just want to give it to whoever I can. And she does just that. For The Local Live, I'm Brenda Blanco.
<laughs> guys, you're watching the local live. Stay tuned. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> And now, for a change of pace, we have a really fun piece. LMC TV's Matt Sullivan takes us into Westchester Civil Air Patrol, and in the process, he learns a thing or two about their history in our skies. We're here at Westchester County Airport with an organization that truly believes the sky's the limit. Civil Air Patrol was created about a week before, authorized by Congress about a week before Pearl Harbor. They realized that the military assets were going to be you know, sent overseas and that the coasts of the United States would be uh, vulnerable. And they enlisted the civilian uh, pilot corps and they mandated that they would be a part of the military as an auxiliary. In fact, they flew coast patrols all during the war. Civil Air Patrol is actually credited with having sunk several German submarines off the coast, off the East Coast. Civil Air Patrol that does probably 90 to 95 percent of the inland search and rescue for the Air Force. And our missions today, by and large, are Homeland Security and FEMA missions, emergency services, cadet programs, and aerospace education. And really, it's really a great program for the cadets, and that's what we're doing here today, is we're going to take a couple of cadets on what's called an orientation flight. So we get them up in the air, we actually get them to fly the plane a little bit, and get them, you know, kind of excited about flying and maybe pursuing a career in aviation. Civil Air Patrol's been something in my family for uh, a long time. I grew up around it and never joined. Um, I have a 14-year-old daughter now, and it was a great opportunity for her. Um, we took her to a couple of meetings. She fell in love with it. Um, I'm always taking her there to the meetings. I kind of fell in love with it, so here we are together. Everything we learn and everybody here is like a family, so we, get, we all get along. It's like... It's just an amazing time we have. Can you guess which village of Mamaroneck trustee is in the Civil Air Patrol? I'm a cadet programs officer for the Southeastern Group that covers Westchester, Dutchess, and Putnam. Uh, I oversee the cadet program for those three counties, which uh, covers, uh, I believe it's four cadet squadrons with about 140 cadets. Do you have uh, a nickname when you're in the sky? Are you a maverick or a goose? Uh, my call sign is actually uh, Ratatouille. Well, Rat Tattoo, you could be my wingman any day. I appreciate your time, and uh, it's been wonderful having you. Thank you for having me. If someone was interested in signing up, how do they do so? They can go on the website, and they can contact any one of the commanders. We ask you to come to a couple of meetings, actually, to see if it's for you, okay? And then we sign you up and uh, give you a membership application. Sounds easy. You may see me at your next meeting. I would love to have you. Reporting for The Local Live, I'm Matt Sullivan. Thank you, Matt. Angel is a gorgeous and playful 15-week-year-old puppy who is believed to be a mix of boxer and American bulldog. She will make the perfect addition to any family, especially ones who have other dogs in the home. Angel is currently about 30 pounds and will most likely grow to a large dog. She is currently up on vac vaccinations, spayed, microchipped, and ready for her forever family. Well, that's all we have for you tonight. Thanks for watching. The Local Live is here for you, not only to broadcast local news, but also to help you get involved. That's right, Jackie. If uh, you or someone you know would like to send us a story or be involved with our team, send us a tweet at, at the local live or email us at thelocallive.lmc.org. And Mamaronek, remember to stay friendly and Larchmont, stay classy. Bye. <laughs> what you think in person over the phone online watch and hear yourself on tv you tell us we air it this is the local live